<laughs> Welcome back to Global Health with Greg Martin. We're talking about literature review. We've got Kevin from Nested Knowledge. And before I even let Kevin say hello, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pile in a question. And Kevin, you can say hello and answer the question all in one. I want to know what your thoughts are about the difference between qualitative literature review and quantitative. And I know people will have a sense of the difference, but I think you're going to really be able to tease this out for us. And then we're going to dig deep on one of the two. So over to you, Kevin. Hi, Greg. Uh, hello, everyone. And I'm happy to just jump right in. Uh, when I think about this, I don't just think about quantitative versus qualitative reviews. I think about qualitative versus quantitative content. So really, from right. the studies that you're looking at, what do you actually want to take from them and show to your reader? So uh, qualitative would be something that's non-numerical, something that's mushier, uh, like a concept from the study, say, what was the study design uh, or what was a, an individual patient's uh, journey through their follow-up? That's going to be more on the qualitative side. You're going to be doing systematic reviews. You're not necessarily going to be able to combine everything into exactly similar numbers. You can't reduce everything that right. way. You're not extracting Whereas, numbers, but you're extracting ideas and seeing how those ideas thread through the different papers that have been studied. Exactly. Whereas quantitative is more like I'm comparing drug A to drug B, and I want to see whether it has higher mortality over a three-year period. That's where you're going to be doing quantitative extraction, where you're going to focus on a specific type of stat uh, statistic. So you're going to extract, you know, like rate of mortality or mean age, and then you're going to do statistics on top of that to find out if there are differences between groups. Qualitative, though, is a whole different ballgame. It's much right. more creative, uh, but it also means that you need to be much more disciplined about reflecting your study design in what you actually want to qualitatively right. extract. Okay, that's interesting. And so the qu quantitative stuff, really, that's the meta-analysis. We're extracting the, the data from the studies, or at least the results of the studies, and we're squishing them all together to get an overall overall picture. Quantitative, we're thinking about the meaning of what's being said in, in the sort of the overall narrative throughout the literature. Okay, now, it's that qualitative review that I've found difficult in the past. I've done these things, but it's never easy. And one of the things that it's quite difficult to do is you, you've got all of these papers, you're reading through them. What I would have done in the past would be highlighting them in yellow and green and looking for like common th themes and threads and uh, like it all gets messy. And and uh, just <laughs> I'm just curious as to your approach. How do you handle that? Have you got a, a way of dealing with the messiness? Actually, And, and I know that you do. <laughs> So I'm kind of setting you up. If, if you'll let me, I'll just jump in and show you exactly the way that I deal with the messiness of the concepts from underlying studies. And I'm going to be pulling this from uh, from several reviews. First, I'm going to show systematic review with meta-analysis to follow. And then I think we can also just show like a qualitative review, like what it would look like if we just drilled down on the concepts mm -hmm. of interest. So here we have actually the review that I use for our systematic review course. And it's a very simple review. It's one of my favorite reviews I've ever done because it really drills down on the key concepts. And we've talked about the PICO framework, right? So you're mm -hmm. bringing your population, right. your interventions and comparators of interest, and then your outcomes. And when it comes to qualitative content, you really want to also in examine things like study characteristics. And that can be as simple as just grabbing what are the study types that you want to include in your review. Uh, of course, you can imagine any other methodological detail can be structured in that same way. But I also want to highlight that you can have a situation where you inform both where, for instance, in your population data, you may want to pull down the exact information about medication or timing, but then you also want to extract it quantitatively. So here you can see in this hierarchy, we have the qualitative concepts under our population hierarchy. So in the category mm -hmm. of population, drilling down on the timing concept, we can also go one deeper and extract quantitatively. Was that timing from, you know, hospital door to OR? Was that from the okay, so ambulance to the hospital? Kevin, you're, so you are already doing something that I never did before, which was before I even start reading the papers, to think through, <laughs> to think what, about yeah, what, what, are, what, are, what are my endpoints? What, what it is, what it is question, that right? I want to be looking for in those papers. And, and I can see the structure that you've got here. So you're saying, as you read the papers, you're going to be looking for things under the heading of population. And what are those things? And you've like subcategorized them into timing uh, and, and you medication, know, medication, demographics. And then within those, you've said, I also want to know age, sex, you know, and whatever yeah. else it is that you're looking for under that heading. And you've got this in a kind of a hierarchy. So you okay, so concepts, that's... yeah, concepts are above the quality, uh, the, sorry, the quantitative element that you might want to extract from those studies. And, and so what this can, looks like, yeah. What would happen if you've set this up, mm -hmm. but then while you're reading the papers, you realize actually there's a theme or an idea or a concept uh, in the paper that's not part of the hierarchy that you've set up, that you've included in that, in that hierarchical diagram that you've got there. I, and I, again, I know the answer to this question because I've seen you do this, but you can create those tags on the fly, can you not? 
Absolutely. And that's where you do have to exercise discipline. So if I'm coming in here and I'm looking at this, this is a non-randomized study, so I can tag it with prospective cohort. And you said highlighting earlier, right? Your highlighting was probably a little bit less sophisticated than coming in and grabbing an excerpt and that excerpt effectively following the study from then on. So we apply that tag in the moment that we uh, grab the excerpt of interest, it will populate it in here, apply the tag, and then I will always be able to jump back to that at any point in the future. So once I've highlighted prospective cohort tag, I can jump back and find that evidence myself, and it'll highlight in a nice blue rather than your uh, uh, aggressive yellow. Okay. If I then turn around and I have another methodological tag that I want to add, uh, I can already, as you say, come in, and let's say that I wanted to say setting as a new tag that I wanted to add to every study to reflect where the work was done, I can simply start typing it and I can add that option. And our software at the very least will offer you the capability of adding that to your hierarchy directly. So we can already say setting is a study design characteristic. I'm going to create that. And then I'm going to go in and I'm going to immediately highlight the text that reflects setting. That okay, is the, nice. what we, what we call is tagging on the fly. So rather than tagging on just the having to build from the start, hey, here are all the concepts that we'll ever want to extract from studies. We recognize that reviews are actually a learning enterprise. You yeah, start right. out with a with a goal. And then as you're going, you encounter concepts that you had no idea that you would. And you might need to add those to your hierarchy. And really, if you think about that, therefore add it to both your study design and your outputs. That's nice. That's nice. And just so that people know, what you're seeing on the screen at the moment is nested knowledge. Uh, that's the platform. Kevin is the chief executive of Nested Knowledge, so he obviously, you know, he, he knows the platform very, very well. Pretty well. Pretty well. Uh, I okay. wanted to move on to yep. really drilling down on what are concepts that are qualitative and worth extracting. And for that, I'll actually turn to a published review that we completed in a very similar disease state. And uh, for this, we actually used a new feature that, Greg, I'm not even sure if you've heard about, but we actually now have an API out to clinicaltrials.gov. So you can create uh -huh. a search and nested knowledge where you're not just pulling down finished trials. You're actually pulling down active trials that are ongoing in your space. Uh -huh. And once you've run that search, you can look at the underlying uh, study designs and you can qualitatively uh, reflect things like what are all the endpoints that they're going to extract from this underlying study? And I actually published this in collaboration with some Stanford neurosurgeons where they drilled down on not just, you know, what were the endpoints reported in this in this discipline, but also all the way down to what were the imaging outcomes with their time points and with the exact phrasing from the underlying study. And they used this to turn around and design another study. So nice. if you think about that, we're taking all the concepts of interest, we're reducing them to uh, the the hierarchy that they should live within. So and uh, outcomes, imaging outcomes. And then underneath that, we go all the way down to, okay, how are they characterizing the imaging? What machines are they using? What time points are they doing it at? And that's one of the flexibilities that you get when you're doing qualitative extraction. You're not going to need to do statistics on top of this as you, know, you would with mortality. Instead, you're going to be able to drill down as far as you want on the underlying concepts of interest yeah. and even see them within the underlying studies. So, and this, what you've got on the screen now is called the sunburst diagram, right? And this is basically the same as that hierarchy you had before, but now it's got all of the, the, the bits and pieces of the papers that have been tagged are associated with those tags. And you can click on one of the little blocks within the, the sunburst diagram and see everything that's been tagged with that particular word or phrase concept. or idea, yeah. <laughs> concept. And, that, and they're all together and then you can read through them and, and make some sort of sense of it. Absolutely beautiful. I love it. I, I, so I've done this. I've, I've used this, by the way, this, this sunburst diagram. And uh, I must be honest. Once you've used it once, you, you, you just can't imagine doing this kind of. This you you kind can't of go back to putting an Excel sheet together no, with columns you just couldn't. where, you yeah, no, it, it just couldn't. doesn't work. And especially, I found that when you're turning around and publishing this, uh, or when you're sharing this with a user it's really hard for them to go back as well because on top of, you know, you're structuring it for them, right? So you take yeah, that exact yeah, same hierarchy yeah. and, you know, we have it presented on the site so the user can learn from that hierarchy that you built, but then we also offer that sunburst so they can see the frequency of these concepts within underlying studies yeah. and do combinatorial filters to say, okay, well, how many of the studies reported CSDH with one way and volume another uh, in, in this case? Once you've, once you've seen this, Kevin, you can't unsee it. <laughs> exactly. We then have the ability to say, okay, what concepts are, uh, work together, right? What concepts work together to give us a conclusion? For instance, if we are able to see that, you know, most studies that report CSDH width at 90 days also report volume at 90 days, we could say 90 days is the preferred time point. Very simple insight, but we can just add that, create it, and then any user who's coming back to this site from here on out is going to be able to come in and automatically filter to our 
insight. So we're effectively taking the same concepts and we're now grouping them not by are they related, but do they bring me to an important conclusion that I want to share with my nice. readers? And so that's where, you know, it goes way beyond, well, am I going to be able to see data in an Excel sheet anymore? Um, it goes all the way to, am I going to be able to write a 3000 word manuscript about yeah. something when I could have just given a tweet length insight that someone could have interpreted? And you're pulling out the insights. And then when you, when you write your paper, that's what you're going to look at. And the, what you're going to reference is given to you because you know that those insights come from these papers and those are the references that you'll put in to the, to the literature review for that particular concept. It gets really easy uh, uh, once you get down to the insight level. You can actually put in your publication. You can embed in a website, not just the, not just the sunburst diagram, but any insight. So I could take that insight that I just made. I could add it to a, um, I could add it to an embeddable, or I could link it in my publication. And then I'm not just saying, hey, here's all the data, figure out where my conclusion was. You can actually say, here's exactly all the data that feed my conclusion that I'm now stating in this paper. So it's okay. data in context. Very cool. Very cool. Okay. Yeah. Well, I've never met someone that can make lit review as exciting as you do, Kevin. Uh, quick question, unrelated to this. Um, Absolutely. Let's zoom out. Chat GPT. Oh, everyone's talking about it, aren't they? Please talk so, to me. So, Greg, give is me your AI thoughts. Is AI going to take over the world, and why haven't they just called it Skynet? The world of systematic review. And uh, actually, we had, we had a blog about this, and I know you've been talking to this about people who listen to your channel, but I think ChatGPT is super promising, and we did a lot of tests on it. Uh, I do not think, though, that it's going to replace your expert judgment. And by that, I mean, when you're actually building these reviews, the hardest part is not actually in like grabbing all the content. It's good study design. So even right. if we're going to have ChatGPT be useful in the future, it's going to be building on what you feed it, right? right? And what you feed it for a given study should be the structured ideas that should be coming out of these underlying studies. Okay. We're going to have to have a whole conversation just about <laughs> ChatGPT. If, like, we, we are. We can schedule that for follow-up, but I'll give absolutely. you the, the teaser. The teaser here is that I think ChatGPT has a lot of promise for interpreting a search. So if I just say a phrase, like I want to search for uh, studies of basilar artery stroke, uh, they have to be randomized controlled trials, and I hope that they report mortality. I think ChatGPT could go a long way to turning that into a Boolean query on, say, PubMed. And we've right. tried that out, and I think it's not quite there for the major reason that scientific search isn't like chatting. It has to be structured. Yeah. And they don't yet have the structure there where I can come in with a concept and know that if I add that structured concept to my search, that ChatGPT will recognize uh, and move forward with it. So I think the structure bit has to be added in order for this to be a scientific search and not just a, you know, a, a, a good chat response. Yeah, and I'd say that there's going to be a version of these kind of chatbots that'll that'll just, you know, lean into this hard um, oh, I, I believe so. I, I'm sure that there is someone at, at OpenAI who's uh, big into structured vocabularies and is going to be adding them no doubt, to, no. to GPT-4. There's a nice little phrase that I heard. It's, it's you know, AI is, AI is not going to take your job, but someone who uses AI will, uh, you know, like- Very much so. Or you could take someone's guy. job by employing the right AI. Exactly. Uh, we uh, want to be that guy. Yeah. The entrepreneurial way. <laughs> uh, Listen, but yeah. we, we, we're going to, and, and, unless there's anything else, Kevin, I think we're going to say cheers. Um, no, I think this is a, a good setup for talking about GPT throughout the the entire or any yeah. AI throughout the systematic review lifecycle. If you've been watching this and you wanting to do a systematic literature review, click on the, the there's going to be a little uh, card on the screen right now. Click on that card. We're going to give you a free cheat sheet. That cheat sheet is the beginning of this process. It's going to give you this is how to do a literature review. Off the back of that, uh, Kevin and myself are going to have many more conversations about lit review and how to do it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We've got lots of information. There's a course you can do for free. Uh, so don't ever change. Don't do drugs. Always do your best. Take care. Bye. Thanks, everybody.